I'm Ian Thomas, the editor of Front Office Sports. I'm joined here by Deja Lesta. She is the Chief Revenue Officer of Barstool Sports. Deja, it's been about two years since you joined Barstool. When you were first presented with this opportunity, what did you see with this company when you were stepping in? What did, what did you think you could do or what you could bring to this role? So, yeah, I joined just over two years ago. Um, you know, Erica uh, had approached me about the, the CRO position. Um, I had been following Barstool both as a, a fan and a consumer, but also as an industry person just looking at this growing sports media brand um, that was really um, getting very popular with all the people around me that I worked with and, and that worked for me. So I was very intrigued. The fact that Barstool had not only a big advertising and growing advertising business, but also an e-commerce brand that people truly loved and felt like a part of, um, I felt, thought Barstool was more than just a media company, it was a lifestyle. So uh, that excited me and then some of the other things I thought were really interesting were just the, the growth of not only the Barstool brand but the sub-brands beneath it, the franchises like Pardon My Take and KFC Radio and shows like The Rundown just had become staples within the Barstool uh, universe, uh, had become really popular with you know, different groups of fans. Um, so that, you know, for me, as somebody who's looking to you know, build advertising partnerships, gave me the idea that there's a lot of different ways to bring brands into this universe. The, the events business for Barstool seems like it continues to grow. These things become more robust, like you said, become bigger parts of other tentpole events that are happening in sports, but you're also kind of creating events on your own. Uh, how much does that help when you're talking to a potential partner who wants to activate or lean heavily into Barstool that you have that? sort of inventory now that you kind of can play with beyond just the immense amount of content that you guys are just creating digitally all the time. Yeah, so it's immensely helpful, especially when we have the opportunity to bring clients or potential customers to an event and let them experience that with the fans so they get to see the fan engagement, the brand love for Barstool, the fact that we can kind of just show up pretty much anywhere and hundreds, depending on the venue, hundreds or thousands of people will come. If we if we do a ticketed event, you know, at you know Irving Plaza for Pup Punk, which is our you know uh, satirical punk rock band, like we will sell it out in a day. You know, so our golf outings that we did last year, the Barstool Classic, sold out in in just a few hours. So um, to be able to show that up close and personal to brands is really powerful uh, because they want to they want to be part of that experience, part of that environment. Environment. And I think the events business is something that a lot of digital media companies are trying to be in and trying to create and it can be really difficult. And there's that moment of, okay, we made this huge investment, we put all this planning, we, we were able to secure sponsors and now we're launching this event and is anyone going to come? And I can tell you that we never have that feeling at Barstool. We know people are going to come. Uh, we're smart about where we go. We know where our fans live and where they are. Um, but pretty much, you know, we can go anywhere at this point and we'll be able to draw a pretty large crowd of people who consider themselves like true, tried and true Barstool fans. When it comes to that, the brand messaging, when you, when you bring these partners in, to your point, they're fans of Barstool, know what they're going to get from the content creators. They know the messaging that a, a Dave or a KFC is going to give them. That's what draws them and keeps them close to the brand. How, uh, Barstool itself, how do you coach brands into the idea of you know, embracing that, making sure that their message stays on brand with what Barstool is and fans don't you know, reject it in some capacity? Yeah, so authenticity is key. It's an overused word in the industry, obviously, but for us it really is like we have to remain authentic to, to Barstool's tone and voice, and that's not for everyone, right? So I think you know, a lot of brands and everyone is kind of overly obsessed with the words brand safety in the industry right now. Um, and I think of it as brand suitability. Like if our brand is suitable for you, then your brand is likely to be suitable for ours. It's just as important for their brand and their brand messaging to be suitable for our brand as it is for our brand to be suitable for them. Otherwise, you know, we're asking our personalities to create content that is inauthentic or forced. So not only will fans reject it, the talent and personalities won't feel great about it and that comes through. So we really kind of look to brands that know our voice, know our tone, are unafraid to get involved with, you know, Barstool and sort of our brand of humor, um, which is sometimes, you know, un misunderstood, right? So um, that's a process, you know, there's a lot of 
uh, conversations and making sure and vetting that we're partnering with the right folks. Um, you know, we have tons of transactional media. We have over 250 advertising clients last year. Um, but when I talk about partnerships and really being woven into what we're doing and being front and center uh, with our personalities, I think that's where we really need to make sure that it's a suitable relationship for both sides. Where do you see opportunities in the future in terms of categories or kinds of companies that Barstool could partner with? I mean, obviously a lot of them have blended, I would say, into the spirits or alcohol areas thus far, but do you see other places where you think there are logical kind of links? Obviously it's a brand by brand situation, but category-wise, are there areas you think that are, are ripe uh, in regards to partnering with Barstool? Yeah, I mean, I look. this is what I look at every day. So uh, our number one advertising category in 2019 was Sportsbook, so a, a category that less than 18 months ago did not exist, quickly grew to become a really huge partnership for us. So that's one you can see there's a lot of conversations about strategic partnerships and alignments there. Uh, beer and spirits, 100%, huge category for us. What we've been able to do there, which is exciting, is uh, particularly in the beer and now beer and hard seltzer category where the lines are getting a little blurry, um, is diversify um, to have multiple partners by carving out you know, ownership positions in key franchises. So where we might partner with, you know, Anheuser-Busch and, and Bud Light, Bud Light Seltzer around Pardon My Take and everything they do, we still can go turn and have a partnership with a competitive brand like a Miller Coors and a Coors Light for Chicks in the Office. And uh, their target is more, you know, go skewing female oriented. Uh, they're trying to reach new consumers with that brand. It's an opportunity for us to, to bring in multiple partners. So you'll see us kind of diversify in key categories where we're already having success um, but there's so many others out there that you know we're also driving on I'd look at like what cash app has been able to do with barstool they're yeah. huge they're they're a huge partner um, and there's so many brands in that category that uh, could potentially you know come into our universe in a certain way uh, you look at um, you know, Honey, which is a retail uh, coupon reward uh, app. They're, they're going to be the presenting sponsor of Call Her Daddy, which is the number one female podcast uh, right now. So we're really, like I said, we're not only diversifying uh, within the categories we have, but we're starting to break into new categories and we're really looking at, well, what are the other categories that want to reach young people, you know, are, working either working hard to build their brands because they're new to the marketplace or they're looking to create and refresh their brands um, there's a, there's a lot of that going on as well so um, you know we don't have kind of single categories we're That's looking fair. across the broader spectrum of the advertising landscape and brand partnerships yeah, no, I know I imagine at this point there are very few brands out there that don't know Barstool, you're introducing to them what Barstool is, but maybe there are still some sort of misconceptions about sure. what the brand is. Do you find you're spending time, a lot of time, trying to explain what the brand is or, or who you reach to some degree to folks? Do you think there's still a little bit of misconception about what the Barstool universe is kind of is in totality? Yeah, sure, absolutely. I think, I mean, look, the, the average CMO or brand marketer may not be in our demo, right? So. Ideally what happens, and this happens in a lot of cases, is there's someone, a brand manager, maybe maybe an agency side advocate, whoever it might be that is a Barstool fan follower and understands the, the power of this brand and see, is seeing what we can do for our partners and is championing that. Um, but aside from that, if we don't have that person in there, there's a lot of education that has to happen. How we got to where we are, what we are, how we've diversified the brand, how, how, how big the brand is and how we've outpaced our competitors in a very big way. You know, we look to partner with Nielsen to make sure that we have third party accredited measurement that we know brands and advertisers look to to sort of validate the investments they make and right size those versus competitors. And when we can go in and say, hey, look, we have grown past, you know, we're bigger than the New York Times Digital, we're bigger than ESPN Digital, we're bigger than Bleacher Report, you know, that shocks a lot of people because they're used to, you know, a different story and, and they haven't been told our story yet. You know, two years of out being out in the market selling is, it feels like a long time. We've accomplished a lot, but it's really not a long time when you, you know, relative to how long some of those industry stalwarts have been kind of building their brand equity with advertisers. But I do think people have uh, heard about us when we get there and they're open to learning, they're opening to listening, 
they're interested, and then when they start to get in and follow, they, they start to have fun with it, and they realize like, hey, this is a, a really funny, fun brand, um, and maybe some of the headlines I've read are a little misleading in terms of what they represent, what they stand for.